and uh, my neighbour used to play Talking Heads records for the wall because he used to smoke and he used to listen to some Talking Heads and reggae as well to be fair and uh, that gave me an appreciation of those two forms without realising it. <laughs> so what was the first music you owned where you act actually went out and bought something? <laughs> I bought uh, Simpsons Sing the Blues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even making this. <laughs> no, that's fine. And then also there was uh, Sufi folk music, like Indian folk music concerts that went on behind the school and at first they kept me awake and then I'd sneak out into the garden and go up the garden path and uh, listen to Sufi folk music and then after a couple of years I like, started singing along to it because <laughs> it's just like a regular thing every year. Sibara, The Who, uh, your kind of staples of your kind of typical rock I suppose um, and King Crimson of course because yeah The Court of the Crimson King just completely changed my world. Why did you say of course? If, was your dad uh, heavily into that then was he? he? He had one copy of Court of the Crimson King, the first island edition of it. I've listened to it again recently, but I particularly Epitaph. God, it's I gorgeous. <laughs> and the swelling of the strings yeah. as well, the uh, the Mellotron strings. I didn't even know it was a Mellotron, but you know, I just assumed it was computer generated or whatever, but it didn't seem to matter. It's like they just conjured up their own world with that album, I suppose. And it, it just made me appreciate that music could be art. You know, it didn't have to just be sort of indie guitar kids. Is that a rocker or...? <laughs> Interestingly enough, um, this is what I pieced together. He used to play music, he used to have a wah wah pedal. Um, and he used to uh, be a very good guitarist. Like, he learned lots of Fleetwood Mac, showed me a few things about. Um, so basically the only thing he really taught me was how to bend a string and play an A minor. And that was enough. <laughs> you know, because he just wanted me to kind of work it out for myself. And, uh, you know, at first he was hogging my guitar, and this was about 17, I suppose. But he used to play guitar, and by all accounts was very good at it, but I didn't, I only heard snippets over the years, I suppose. I only have one thing to go on that. He had a best mate called Will, and presumably they made some music to go. It seems odd that um, he doesn't talk about it more since you're into music. Is it something he's keeping quiet or...? Um, <laughs> he, he hasn't elaborated on it, mm. to be honest with you. He's quite a fascinating guy, but um, musically he hasn't really elaborated on why he gave it up. I, I presume because it was, it was because I was born. <laughs> it's quite fascinating though, isn't it? But he was absolutely mesmerised. Well, he's absolutely mesmerised and amazed uh, and he, he really encouraged me because I decided to get a guitar instead of a motorbike essentially and so it could have been a very different path the same year that James Blunt was getting raved about he read the lyrics to Dali and he, he said he had read a song the lyrics to it and he said I, I don't suppose it would get the same notoriety as James Blunt but I appreciate the lyrics because it sums up this character in abstract terms, in the only way it can be, and he told me that, and then it just made me learn something about the way I wrote, I suppose, because he actually got the subtext. But I liked it enough to uh, go out and buy a copy of Bleach on vinyl, and this is while everybody else was listening to Oasis. Like I was just like, oh, but Bleach is just amazing, mm -hmm. you know. And I didn't realise because I was a bit of a social misfit. Like I didn't realise that my friend in school also. Like was quite sad, and one day took a day off, and I didn't realise that the reason he took the day off was because Kurt Cobain died. You see, so I got into Nirvana a little bit later, I suppose. In film school, somehow I ended up doing an ND in pop because I just started playing guitar, and it was just a hobby. You know, I even laughed about it. I was really cynical about it. I was just like, it's just a hobby. You know, it's just music, whatever, something to do. And uh, what I didn't realise was that by doing that course, I met people who got me into, you know, Tom Waits, uh, a bit of Neil Young, uh, all kinds of random stuff. And then my dad would be like, "I've got that in my record collection. I've got this," you know, and like, and just let me listen to some of it. And I don't think I otherwise would have, you know, not Tom Waits, mm -hmm. obviously. Like it was uh, my friend Carlo, like he uh, he owned a lot of avant-garde. You know, and really got me heavily into making avant-garde music. Even before I could make real music, it was just like, yeah, but you can just 
throw anything together and uh, <laughs> I've, I've you got like a soundscape, you know, like my teacher Greg Pierce, uh, and he got me into a lot of avant-garde music. He had lots of Stockhausen and Harry Parch, um, and Zappa, of course. Like Zappa sort of came along, you know, with it. It was almost like a maturity, you know, like it was like, wow, I really like this early Pink Floyd stuff that doesn't sound like the other Pink Floyd stuff. Why is that? Oh, that guy was called Sid Barrett, and then find out about Sid Barrett. Mention it to my tutor, and he's just like, "Yeah, I can lend you some Sid Barrett. Here's a copy of Opal." You know, <laughs> when you couldn't even really get it. You know, it's quite hard to get hold of. And uh, yeah, he just freely lent me it. And then like, I've got the guitar chords to Octopus as well, if you want them. And it's like, yeah, okay. So you were really excited at this point about starting a band. So when when were your first live? experiences yeah. <laughs> uh, that is really interesting um, well I, I'm going to have to mention it um, around about sort of 17 to 18 uh, my friends got me got me a guitar in fact I've got it here <laughs> right, do, you want to, do you want me to have a look at it so you've still got this same guitar from yeah this yeah. is the one they got me uh, it's a little bit buggered condition at the moment but it's a uh, yeah, 983 Fender Performer uh, with a double locking tremolo system, Floyd Rose. Uh, it's got a rosewood neck, and this is cedarwood, so it's got this particularly weird wooden sound to it, and almost like uh, the pickups give it this kind of almost like a, a chorus effect, you see. But the, it's not really there, it's just a combination of the body and the pickups. And uh, yeah, like this guitar just gave me loads of sounds that I just I don't think I ever would have had. <laughs> so what made them get it to you? Because we were really eager to start a band. Right. And there was one of us, two of us who played guitar. I played guitar, but I wrote songs. They didn't do either. Um, but they, one of them wrote lyrics and one of them played bass. And it was just like, yeah, it, it was like, let's have a band. And then they kind of got me this. <laughs> Even though it was about, I think it was about 600 quid <laughs> at the time. Wow. Like, yeah. It's been valued as more than that, but yeah, like they uh, they got me this um, because they really wanted us to have a band. Like, So we got the bassist a bass, uh, we got the guitarist a guitar, but our income shifted as we got each thing, you see. So the first birthday was like the guitarist, my friend Rick. Um, and it would be like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get a guitar. It sounds like your band were pretty serious to spend serious money on it, equipment. What was the band called I think at they this really point? wanted to do it, yeah. It was Dante. Oh, yeah. right, okay. It's because one of them had a fixation with Dante's Inferno. <laughs> and what kind of music was you playing at this point? <laughs> <laughs> very, very uh, trying to be indie, but punk. Right. But not so really having a clue, like using capos and overdrive pedals because we really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> and short tracks at the time then, was it? Two minute, three minute songs? Yeah, until we wrote this thing called Latino Desperado and that was about like an hour long or wow. something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, never see the light of day. And what venues were you playing then? Just the Starbridge Rock Cafe, <laughs> right? And is it still there, or is it called uh, something else? Yeah, it's the Rock Cafe Two Thousand. There was right. Okay. <laughs> and what's what was your audience like? What 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 kind of audience were you getting? Open mic ones, really. Right. I okay. You kind of almost like the bars, but on yeah. Wednesday night. I think. I've always been quite volatile. Right. So I probably had a temper fit <laughs> and slowly pushed them out by one by one. And we adapted to another band with the bassist and I. Uh, and we formed a band called Mostly Harmless, named after the Douglas Adams. Well, that's where Psychedelia came in, because it was right. just like, I was loving Sid Barrett. Yeah. Uh, it's just like, I love delay pedals. And then John Joe joined the band that me and my college friend had started. Um, John joined on fiddle, like, and that was actually the time we wrote Darley. Right. Like, yeah, uh, John Joe just came downstairs and went, oh, I'll put some fiddle on that. <laughs> and it was just like, wow. Incredible! This is the start. Of something really quite good, you know. And then, like that's without mentioning Ed, Ed Steelfox, another musical pivot. You know, everything just influences each other. And, and I don't know, it's just great when it works that way. Started to go. I've got enough knowledge now. Now it's about time for people to listen to what I think they should be listening to. I've always really appreciated 
other stuff that people just haven't got. Like I like Lindisfarne, it's a bit cheesy at times, but I like Alan Hall, he's one of my favourite songwriters, you know. And not many people would name drop him because he's not cool, you know, he's not Bukowski, he's not Tom Wright, he's, he's not Bob Dylan. You know, nobody would go, oh yeah, I like Alan Hall, I like Winter Song, that sums up a season as a perfect verse, almost like Keats, mm -hmm. you know, really honestly and sincerely. And of its time, yeah, and just beautiful, mm -hmm. and nobody would mention it, you know, but <laughs> it needs to be mentioned. 1147 was quite important. Okay. Why, was. why was that? Who started that? Uh, it's James Perry and yeah. Ed Dark. Ed oh. Dark's um, gone, in, gone further into his film career and what he does. Uh, you know, and he's done some quite good short films, and he works on some pretty big name productions and things, and he's quite esteemed, you know, in that field. But he's, he's, you know, um, they, from what I can gather, they started 11.47 with the rules, no egos, it's not about the money. <laughs> you know, so it's almost like rules to live by, like, no egos, it's not about the money, and, uh, like, it's not about the headliner. <laughs>